that would be wonderful. Rosemary, she has to go back because she is jiggled so much and stretches. They have to make sure the alignment is good. So Rosemary Hill is going to go back into the hospital and uh, I'm not going to say that she's jiggled too much, but anyways, uh, we want to uh, continue to pray for her self as well. So let us go to our Heavenly Father this morning in prayer. Father God, we thank you that your Heavenly Father we come to you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning you have given us and all that are here to worship you on this Easter Sunday morning. For you take great delight in your people when they come together in your name to worship you. And Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray to you and uh, pray for your Holy Spirit to have its way at this service, Lord, and lead us in worshiping you. And Lord, may you leave here, Lord, in a spirit of worship that not only changes our lives, but it begins to change the lives of those in our families and those around us who are our good friends and those, Lord, who are lost and, and don't know you. Lord, may we continue to propagate the gospel of Christ in whatever way we live, in whatever way and how we live for you. And Lord, May your love and your kindness and your firmness of, 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 of knowledge and scripture, the Lord, be ever seen in us. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the blessings you have given us, Lord. Not only is Christ risen, and Lord, not only has he uh, provided a way of salvation for those uh, who have called upon the name of the Lord, but Lord, every day, Christ is busy and at work in our lives. And we should always take notice and say thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us such a wonderful gift in your only Son to go on the cross and die for our sins. And Lord, we lift up some of those blessings that we take for granted. We thank you for this great country that we live in. We pray for its leadership, our president, and governor, and mayor, and also those men and women who make decisions for us. We pray for our military, those who have served, those who are serving, because we have been blessed by the service. And the names of you lifted up for you this morning, Lord, those who uh, need a, a touch on the body and on the spirit, Lord, to heal them completely, Lord. We just pray that you will send your ministering agents, Lord, and the healing that is needed for the bodies. And Lord, we just continue to lift up our prayer requests to you, for you know the hearts of each and every individual in here. And we lift those up to you this morning as well. And Heavenly Father, we pray for this church and its many facets of ministries. We pray for our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our adult ministries. Lord, that you will continue to use us. And Lord, to, that you will continue to help us grow. Because that is where we are in our relationship with you. For those who have called upon the name of the Lord, we are in a growth spurt, Lord. And may that growth spurt be something that is quite significant. So that we can be more for you in reaching others for Christ. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with our pastor and his family. And as we have been blessed by this service, Lord, that you will continue to use the message this morning to challenge us to leave here better than which we came in. And Lord, to challenge us to help us and understand that a life that is worth living, a life that is worth defending, a life that is worth your honor is a one that has lived in you. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and its truth and all that it means. And Lord, one day a disciple of yours came to you and said, Heavenly Father, how should we uh, pray? And Jesus said to that disciple, to the others who were there, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
There was a time in my younger years when I laughed at my mother who complained that things seemed to be getting smaller. <laughs> and uh, she was a late adapter to glasses. She did not believe that she needed them until she was holding things out so far that um, she couldn't focus on them that way either. This morning, for the first time in a long, long time, I had left the house without my glasses. We were in a hurry to get to the sunrise service this morning, and, uh, and so we said, well, we'll have time after the service to run back by the house. It's kind of on the way, and service ran a little long, and it's like, we don't really have time to go back home. And I said, well, I'll just read it on my phone. I can blow that up as, as big as I need it. But I also left my phone at home. they <laughs> laying with my glasses. And uh, so I'm going to attempt to read the scriptures this morning. Jim, did you bring your peepers this morning? I, I think I'll just concede and, and give in to thank you. I opened the Bible and looked down and thought, it's not going to happen. Oh, it's here. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 15. After, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a sum of money, a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. May God have a blessing for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. The Gospels do not agree on the sequence of events or the details of Jesus' death and resurrection. One of my professors in seminary, when I briefly returned to school to seek my doctorate, which I did not complete, um, but the very first class I took, the professor said that his mother was a devout Sunday school teacher and had decided she was going to reconcile all the gospel accounts on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And right away from the very beginning of that effort, she ran into obstacles. Did the rooster crow once, twice, or thrice? Um, different gospels, different accounts of how many times the rooster crowed. Peter always denied Jesus three times, but the crowing of the rooster is different. The women at the tomb, each account differs in who it lists that was there. Some see this as a flaw and say, you can't rely on anything. They couldn't even agree on the most important events of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, the differences in accounts has always, or at least almost always, given me faith in the scriptures. Because the only way that eyewitnesses ever agree is with collusion. When police interview eyewitnesses to a crime, if their story is the same, they know that they've gotten together and agreed on the facts that they're going to tell because when we see things, we see and perceive them differently. And uh, we see that in relationships, husbands and wives, 
rarely perceive things exactly the same way. And uh, it can lead to difficulties sometimes because uh, no, that wasn't the way it was, it was this way. And some couples who've been married a long time, you'll, you'll listen to them start to tell a story and the other one starts chiming in with their version of the story. And, and pretty soon they're, they're kind of, uh, no, it, it was this way, it was that way. And the story just drags on because they can't agree on the facts. And both were present when it happened. In Matthew's account, the first thing that happened on the day of resurrection was the angel coming and rolling away the stone. That's consistent in the, in the stories, but it's told a little differently in each of them. But in Matthew's account, the angel is there waiting outside the tomb and tells them to go and see the place where Jesus lay. He doesn't tell us whether the women went and saw the place or not. They went as they were told to go tell the disciples that Jesus was going to go before them into Galilee to tell his disciples. The women were the first evangelists. In every story, regardless of how many people went to the tomb, all of them agreed that the women were the very first ones to tell anyone that Jesus was risen. I've always been a part of a church that welcomed women in ministry during my lifetime. Um, the first women were ordained in uh, 1956, I believe was the very first year that women were ordained. It didn't happen quite that soon in Florida, but uh, all my life we've had women who were ordained in ministry uh, the same as I am my whole life. And before that, we had deaconesses. Uh, deaconesses were pastors who were missionaries. Uh, it's funny how even in Baptist churches to this day that will not allow uh, women to be ministers in their local congregations in the states allow women to minister on the mission field. Um, anyway, that's a, a, another story. But the women were the first evangelists. They were the first ones to begin to tell the story that Jesus was raised from the dead. But also, almost from the very beginning, Matthew tells us that the guards who were at the tomb went and told the Jewish leaders what happened. Think about it. They were told that an angel came and rolled away the tomb, rolled away the stone from the tomb. And instead of falling on their knees to say, We've done a terrible thing. We have put to death the Son of God. Instead, they begin to plot. How can we spin this to discredit this event? And so, they convinced the guards with a large sum of money to tell the story that the disciples came and stole away the body of Jesus while they slept. 
sleeping on guard duty in Rome was a capital offense. And so the Jewish leader said, well, if Pilate gets wind of this, we'll, we'll make it all right. You just go out there and tell your story. And so we had from the beginning competing stories of what happened the night or the early morning that Jesus rose from the dead. One story, while plausible, had no life to it. The other story, while almost impossible, came with it a transformation of the life of the believer. The women encountered Jesus. that morning. They fell on their knees and worshipped him. Again, accounts differ. In John's Gospel, it's only Mary Magdalene who meets Jesus in the garden. But regardless of whom and how many the encounter of Christ is essential to the experience of Easter. If Christ is not risen in our hearts and lives, if he is not alive in us, then as I said a few weeks ago, quoting Paul, we among all men are most to be pitied. For if Christ has not been raised, then we, are still in our sins. But as I also read in that same sermon, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits. Jesus is alive. That's why we're here this morning. That's why Easter is such a big deal in the Christian church. Jesus died for our sins and rose again that we might have life. And it is his presence in our lives that we celebrate. Every Sunday is a mini resurrection Sunday. Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, we worship on the first day of the week. There are those who worship on Saturday, believing that that was the way God set it up in the beginning and that's the way we ought to keep doing it forever and ever on end. But most of the Christian church across the centuries has always celebrated Sunday as the day of resurrection. And it's an appropriate day for us to worship and we'll do so next Sunday and the next and the next and the next. Christians will be doing that until Christ comes. Thanks be to God for the hope we have in Christ. Because it's not just a hope that when we die, we get to go to heaven. Our hope is that as we live, we can live as people who have been forgiven. That is the good news of the gospel. Christ died. Christ rose again. Christ will come again. We've got to keep on keeping on and keep telling our story, the story that is filled with hope, the story that Jesus rose from the dead. And we have encountered his presence. 
I've met a few people over the years who have had an experience of Christ where they saw the Lord. I've never had one of those experiences where I felt I was in the physical presence of Christ. And part of me has always been a little jealous of those who have had one of those experiences where Jesus spoke to them in a physical form. Mine has always been through faith. I've experienced the very real presence of Christ in my life and in my heart. The transformation that Christ has been a part of is something that I will always, always, always be grateful for. Until I meet him face to face. But whatever our experience of Christ, know that Jesus is alive. And he's still at work looking to reach out to others that they might know his love and his forgiveness. There is such a burden that is lifted from our lives when we can let go of our past hurts and heartaches. For some of us, for some of us that's a harder journey than for others. Some are able to just let go and, and never look back. Others of us, it's a, it's a recurring, renewing journey. Father, help me forgive as I've been forgiven. Help me to let go. It's something we're capable of reclaiming all too easily. And so we've got to remain in relationship with Him. Constantly loving, constantly renewing His forgiveness and our forgiveness. But Jesus is alive. It was a lie that the disciples stole his body. It is the truth that he is alive and is going before us even now. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Lord, if there's anyone who needs to renew that relationship or start it for the first time, on this day of resurrection, may we open our hearts to you, dear God. Jesus, come into our lives. Forgive us. Cleanse us. make us new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is In the Garden, number 315. 314. If you can and will, please stand and sing with me.
May the joy of knowing Him be renewed in our hearts. And now may the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, flesh, preserve and keep us all, now and forevermore. Amen.